Hello, everyone. We will continue with the reading of Bill Cooper's Behold a Pale Horse. Chapter three, Oath of Initiation of an Unidentified Secret Order from a mother who states that her son took this oath and who must remain unidentified and Congressional Record House 1913, furnished by Dr. Ron Brown. Not yet, O freedom, close thy lids in slumber, for thine enemy never sleeps. Bryant. This is a note from the author. The author makes no claims whatsoever regarding this oath. It was handed to me by a woman who claimed that her son took this oath. Another source, Dr. Ron Brown, independent of and not known by the first, furnished a copy of the Congressional Record of the House of Representatives dated February 15, 1913, where the same oath is entered as purported to be of the Knights of Columbus. The congressman may have been wrong. However, since the content indicates that this oath may belong either to the Society of Jesus, otherwise known as the Jesuits, or to the Knights of Malta, which is the militia of the Pope, I include this oath only as an example that such oaths do in fact exist and are subversive. Because of the impeccably correct and difficult level of English used, the obvious expert knowledge of religious terminology and form, and the content and format of this oath, I consider it highly unlikely that it is a forgery. You must be the ultimate judge of its authenticity. The truth will win. The oath, I state your name, now in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed Saint John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles, Saint Peter and Saint Paul, and all the saints, sacred host of heaven, and to you, my ghostly father, the superior general of the Society of Jesus founded by Saint Ignatius Loyola, and the pontification of Paul the Third and continued to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin, the matrix of God and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that his holiness, the Pope, is Christ's vice regent and is the true and only head of the Catholic or universal church throughout the earth. And that by virtue of the keys of binding and loosing given his holiness by my savior, Jesus Christ, he hath power to depose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, and they may be safely destroyed. Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I will defend this doctrine and his holiness's right and custom against all usurpers of the heretical or Protestant authority, whatever, especially the Lutheran Church of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, and the now pretended authority and churches of England and Scotland and the branches of same now established in Ireland and on the continent of America and elsewhere, and all adherents in regard that they may be usurped and heretical, opposing the sacred mother church of Rome. I do now denounce and disown any allegiance as due to any heretical king, prince, or state, named Protestant or liberals, or obedience to any of their laws, magistrates, or officers. I do further declare that the doctrine of the churches of England and Scotland, of the Calvinists, Huguenots, and others of the names of Protestants or Masons to be damnable, and they themselves to be damned who will not forsake the same. I do further declare that I will help assist and advise all or any of His Holiness's agents in any place where I should be in Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Ireland, or America or in any other kingdom or territory, I shall come to and do my utmost to extirpate the heretical Protestant or Masonic doctrines and to destroy all their pretended powers, legal or otherwise. I do further promise and declare that notwithstanding, I am dispensed with to assume any religion heretical for the propagation of the Mother Church's interest to keep secret and private all her agents' counsels from time to time, as they entrust me 
and not divulge directly or indirectly by word, writing, or circumstances, whatever, but to execute all that should be proposed, given in charge or discovered unto me by you, my ghostly father, or any of this sacred order. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own or any mental reservation whatsoever, even as a corpse or cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ, that I will go to any part of the world whithersoever I may be sent, to the frozen regions north, jungles of India, to the centers of civilization of Europe, or to the wild haunts of the barbarous savages of America, without murmuring or repining, and will be submissive in all things whatsoever is communicated to me. I do further promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly and openly, against all heretics, Protestant and Masons, as I am directed to do to extirpate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate their execrable race. That when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisonous cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the pon poniard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agents of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Father of the Society of Jesus. In confirmation of which I hereby dedicate my life, soul, and all corporal powers, and with the dagger which I now receive, I will subscribe my name written in my blood and testimony thereof, and should I prove false or weaken in my determination, May my brethren and fellow soldiers of the militia of the Pope cut off my hands and feet and my throat from ear to ear, my belly opened and sulfur burned therein with all the punishment that can be inflicted upon me on earth and my soul shall be tortured by demons in eternal hell forever. That I will in voting always vote for a K of C in preference to a Protestant and especially a Mason and that I will leave my party so to do, that if two Catholics are on the ticket, I will satisfy myself which is the better supporter of Mother Church and vote accordingly, that I will not deal with or employ a Protestant if in my power to deal with or employ a Catholic, that I will place Catholic girls in Protestant families, that a weekly report may be made of the inner movements of the heretics, that I will provide myself with arms and ammunition that I may be in readiness when the word is passed, or I am commanded to defend the church either as an individual or with the militia of the Pope. All of which I state my name, do swear by the blessed Trinity and blessed sacrament, which I am now to receive to perform and on part to keep this my oath. In testimony hereof, I take this most holy and blessed sacrament of the Eucharist and witness the same further with my name written with the point of this dagger dipped in my own blood and seal in the face of this holy sacrament. Wow. Well, all I could think of when I was reading that is you hear about the inflexibility. Now I'm not an expert on Islam, but you hear about how inflexible Muslims are supposedly about infidels, right? How you hear that they believe that they should kill the infidel. And this sounds as equally nuts. Back in the Middle Ages, we had the Crusades, and we've had wars between religions for hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's not surprising to me if we, in fact, did have 
secret societies that carried on those extreme views. Okay, chapter four, secret treaty of Verona, precedent and positive proof of conspiracy. In 1916 Congressional Records Senate, Mr. Owen, I wish to put in the record the secret treaty of Verona of November 22nd, 1822, showing what this ancient conflict is between the rule of the few and the rule of the many. I wish to call the attention of the Senate to this treaty because it is the threat of this treaty, which was the basis of the Monroe Doctrine. It throws a powerful white light upon the conflict between mon monarchical governments and government by the people. The Holy Alliance under the influence of Metternich, the premier of Austria in 1822, issued this remarkable secret document. American Diplomatic Code 1778 to 1884. The undersigned especially authorized to make some additions to the Treaty of the Holy Alliance after having exchanged their respective credentials have agreed as follows. Article one, the high contracting powers being convinced that the system of representative government is equally as incompatible with the mon monarchical principles as the maxim of the sovereignty of the people with the divine right, engage mutually in the most solemn manner to use all their efforts to put an end to the system of representative governments in whatever country it may exist in Europe and to prevent its being introduced in those countries where it is not yet known. Article two, as it cannot be doubted that the liberty of the press is the most powerful means used by the pretended supporters of the rights of nations to the detriment of those of princes, the high contracting parties promise reciprocally to adopt all proper measures to suppress it, not only in their own states, but also in the rest of Europe. Article three, convinced that the principles of religion contribute most powerfully to keep nations in the state of passive obedience, which they owe to their princes, the high contracting parties declare it to be their intention to sustain in their respective states those measures which the clergy may adopt with the aim of ameliorating their own interests, so intimately connected with the preservation of the authority of the princes and the contracting powers join in offering their thanks to the Pope for what he has already done for them and solicit his constant cooperation in their views of submitting the nations. Article four, the situation of Spain and Portugal unite unhappily all the circumstances to which this treaty has particular reference. The high contracting parties in confiding to France the care of putting an end to them engage to assist her in the manner which may be the least compromit them with their own people and the people of France by means of a subsidy on the part of the two empires of 20 million of francs every year from the date of the signature of this treaty to the end of the war. Article five, in order to establish in the peninsula the order of things which existed before the re revolution of Cadiz, and to ensure the entire execution of the articles of the present treaty, the high contracting parties give to each other the reciprocal assurance that as long as their views are not fulfilled, rejecting all other ideas of utility or other measure to be taken, they will address themselves with the shortest possible delay to all the authorities existing in the states and to all their agents in foreign countries with the view to establish connections tending towards the accomplishment of their objects proposed by this treaty. Article six, this treaty shall be renewed with such changes as new circumstances may give occasion for either at a new Congress or at the court of one of the contracting parties as soon as the war with Spain shall be terminated. Article seven, the present treaty shall be ratified and the ratifications exchanged at Paris within the space of six months, made at Verona, the 22nd November, 1822. Signed by Austria, France, Prussia, and Russia. 
Mr. Owen, I asked to have printed in the congressional record this secret treaty because I think it ought to be called now to the attention of the people of the United States and the world. This evidence of the conflict between the rule of the few versus popular government should be emphasized on the minds of the people of the United States that the conflict now waging throughout the world may be more clearly understood. For after all said, the great pending war springs from the weakness and frailty of government by the few, where human error is far more probable than the errors of the many, where aggressive war is only permitted upon the authorizing vote of those whose lives are jeopardized in the trenches of modern war. Mr. Shafroth. Mr. President, I would like to have the Senator state whether in that treaty there was not a coalition formed between the powerful countries of Europe to reestablish the sovereignty of Spain and the republics of South and Central America. Mr. Owen, I was just going to comment upon that, and I'm going to take but a few moments to do so because I realize the pressure of other matters. This holy alliance, having put a Bourbon prince upon the throne of France by force, then used France to suppress the constitution of Spain immediately afterwards, and by this very treaty gave her a subsidy of 20 million francs annually to enable her to wage war upon the people of Spain and prevent their exercise of any measure of the right of self-government. The Holy Alliance immediately did the same thing in Italy by sending Austrian troops to Italy, where the people there attempted to exercise a like measure of liberal constitutional self-government. And it was not until the printing press, which the Holy Alliance so stoutly opposed, taught the people of Europe the value of liberty that finally one country after another seized a greater and greater right of self-government until now it may be fairly said that nearly all the nations of Europe have a very large measure of self-government. However, I wish to call the attention of the Senate and the country to this important history and the growth of constitutional popular self-government. The Holy Alliance made its powers felt by the wholesale drastic suppression of the press in Europe by universal censorship, by killing free speech and all ideas of popular rights, and by the complete suppression of popular government. The Holy Alliance, having destroyed popular government in Spain and in Italy, had well laid plans also to destroy popular government in the American colonies which had revolted from Spain and Portugal and Central and South America under the influence of the successful example of the United States. It was because of this conspiracy against the American republics by the European monarchies that the great English statesman Canning called the attention of our government to it. And our statesmen then, including Thomas Jefferson, took an active part to bring about the declaration by President Monroe in his next annual message to the Congress of the United States that the United States would regard it as an act of hostility to the government of the United States and an unfriendly act if this coalition or if any power of Europe ever undertook to establish upon the American continent any control of any American Republic or to acquire any territorial rights. This is the so-called Monroe Doctrine. The threat under the secret treaty of Verona to suppress popular government in the American republics is the basis of the Monroe Doctrine. This secret treaty sets forth clearly the conflict between monarchical governments and popular sub government and popular government and the government of the few as against the government of the many. It is a part in reality of developing popular sovereignty when we demand for women equal rights to life to liberty, to the possession of property, to an equal voice in making of laws and the administration of the laws. This demand on the part of women is made by men, and it ought to be made by men as well as by thinking, progressive women, as it will promote human liberty and human happiness. I sympathize with it, and I hope that all parties will, in the national conventions, give their approval to this larger measure of liberty 
to the better half of the human race. Author's note, anyone who believes that the monarchs after being deposed forgave and forgot is not playing with a full deck. Most of these families are wealthy beyond belief and may be more powerful today than when they sat upon thrones. Today, they are known collectively as the black nobility. Just because the secret treaty of Verona was signed in 1822 does not mean that the treaty is void. It is imperative that you realize that privately, the black nobility refuses to ever recognize any government other than their own inherited and divine right to rule. They work diligently behind the scenes to cause conditions whereby they might regain their crowns. They believe that the United States belongs to England. Chapter five, goodbye USA, hello new world order. Backbone of hidden government, subversion of the balance of power, the plan to suspend the constitution and declare martial law. It could probably be shown by facts and figures that there is no distinctly native American criminal class except Congress. Mark Twain, 1885. The balance of power. When our forefathers wrote the Constitution of these United States, they provided safeguards against despotism by provided a balance of power. The Constitution was set up to provide clear divisions of legislative, judicial, and executive powers. It was believed that this system would ensure that if one branch got out of hand, the other two would act to, to keep the other one in check. This balance of power was predicated upon the assumption that none of the three branches could or would infringe upon the power of the others. The Constitution is clear on the functions of each of the branches. The legislative will make the laws. The judicial will interpret the law. The executive will decide policy and enforce the law. This, of course, is the simplest of explanations, but this is not a textbook on government. My intent is to acquaint you with simple basics of the balance of power so that you can then understand how it has been subverted. The legislature, Congress in the form of the House and the Senate, is required to publish the laws that are made, and this is done in the congressional record and the federal register. Pending or passed legislation can be obtained by citizens through the congressman or from the government printing office. Citizens cannot be held responsible for the law if it is not made available to them. It is paradoxical that the government body most representative of the American citizen is the one that has been the most easily subverted. Through PACs, payoffs, pork barrel politics, professional politicians, congressmen who are members of secret societies, and through greed and fear, our representatives and senators quit representing us long ago. Congress has tremendous powers, but fails in most cases to exercise even a token amount. How is it that our legislature has allowed and at times encouraged the executive branch to write law? You probably did not know that the president and others in the executive branch of the government can and do write law. This is done in the form of presidential executive orders, national security council memos, national security decision directives, and national security directives. NSC memos were a broad policy papers in the days after passage of the National Security Act. NSC memos became narrower and more specific over the years, and the name has varied. Under Kennedy, they were called National Security Action Memorandums. President Bush has changed the name to National Security Directives. There is a tremendous difference between presidential executive orders, NSC memos, and national security decision directives. Presidential executive orders are listed in the Federal Register or presidential findings, which are made known to the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. The most important difference between the presidential executive orders and all of the others, no matter what they are called, is that the others do not have to be reported, reviewed, made available to anyone, or even acknowledge they exist. There is no oversight whatsoever that could maintain a check on the legality of these national security directives. The president and others within the executive branch have used these super secret directives to skirt the balance of power and write law without anyone's knowledge.
Justification of the president's power to write law through executive orders stems from the failure of the government to rescind the declaration of martial law during the Civil War. In effect, the United States has been under martial law ever since Lincoln's administration. These NSDs are powerful, hidden, and dangerous tools. They were prolific during the Reagan administration. Over 300 were written, with no more than 50 ever leaking out to undergo public scrutiny. Yet most Americans have never heard of these subversive weapons. They are being used to destroy our Constitution. I believe that everyone should know about this corruption of government. Congress has turned a blind eye to these abuses of executive power. At 3.30 a.m. Saturday, August 4, 1990, the Senate made it even easier for the executive branch to subvert the Constitution and may have made George Bush the first American king. At that time on that day, a minority of United States senators, maybe 10 at the most, passed Senate Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 1991. This bill will fundamentally change our constitutional system and threatens to destroy the very foundation of our great nation. Since attention has been focused upon the Middle East crisis, the public and most congressmen know absolutely nothing about this bill. The bill was fraudulently introduced as a reform to prevent future incidents of the abuses brought to light during the Iran-Contra scandal. Instead of preventing future abuses, however, it virtually authorizes essentially every abuse. The bill was carefully brought to a vote by Senator Sam Nunn in the dead of the night when the opposition was gone. It effectively transfers most authority over the United States government directly into the hands of George Bush and thus directly into the hands of the secret government. The president, presidently George Bush, was given the power to initiate war, appropriate public funds, define foreign policy goals, and decide what is important to our national security. In oversight of intelligence activities, Tide 7, SB 2834 authorizes the following. Gives the president power to initiate covert actions. This has never before been given to the president. Prevents Congress from stopping the president's initiation of covert actions. Allows the president to use any federal departments, agencies, or entities to operate or finance a covert operation. Empowers the president to use any other nation or private contractor or person to fund or operate a covert action redefines covert actions as operations necessary to support foreign policy objectives of the United States, a definition that is so vague and broad as to be essentially unlimited. For the first time officially claims the right of the United States to secretly interfere in the internal political, economic, or military affairs of other countries in direct and flagrant violation of international law requires that the president prepare and deliver a written finding to the intelligence committees of the Congress, but allows the president to omit extremely sensitive matters and authorizes the president to claim executive privilege if Congress asks too many questions. There are no penalties in the bill for violating any of its provisions, including the provision requiring a finding. Why should there be? This bill has literally handed the power of all the branches of government to the president on a silver platter. President Bush is now truly American King Bush the first. SB 2834 gives Bush the power to use any agency or branch of the government and any appropriated funds from any agency of branch of government for covert action, even if they were never appropriated for that purpose. This bill effectively prevents any oversight by anyone and allows the executive branch to skirt the law and to escape accountability. This will be done using national security directives. A few examples of past NSD directives that have come to light will help you understand the seriousness of the matter. They will be listed in the following paragraphs under the heading of the subject matter of the NSDDs. NSDD 84, Safeguarding National Security Information, Secrecy, March 11, 1983, declassified in full. Subject, 
This directive drastically expands restrictions on government employees' freedom of speech. Those with access to classified information were required to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Those with access to a special category of classified information were made to agree to pre-publication review of any future writings. The use of polygraphs was authorized. Purpose, prevent disclosure of information that could damage national security. Consequences, the polygraph requirement was rescinded due to congressional opposition. Secrecy restrictions were imposed on more than 4 million government employees and contractors for more than 50 executive agencies. Many reporters' contacts were shut down. Government employees, unions, and members of Congress sued to protect the rights of whistleblowers, and the Supreme Court recently sent the case back to their district level for review. Author's note, NSDD 84 indicates that John Lear, Robert Lazar, Bruce Maccabee, Stanton Friedman, Clifford Stone, and many others may be active government agents. They were all working in government jobs or for government contractors, and all of them were subject to this executive order. NSDD 84 was not used to silence them, which seems to indicate that they had executive approval in each and every instance. NSDD 17, deterring Cuban models covert action in Nicaragua, November 23rd, 1981, classified. Subject, the CIA was given authority to create the Contras and work with foreign governments as appropriate to undermine the Sandinista government of Nicaragua. Purpose, to stop the flow of arms from Cuban and Nicaraguan sources to the Salvadoran rebels. Consequences. The CIA was given 19 million to assemble and arm a force of 500 Contras to join with a thousand exiles already being trained by Argentina. Scores of operatives arrived in Honduras. Armed shipments from Miami began. The Contra war was set in motion. NSDD 77, management of public diplomacy relative to national security. January 14th, 1983, declassified in full. Subject, this directive set up several planning groups to conduct public diplomacy activities. It ordered organizational support for foreign governments and private groups to encourage the growth of democratic political institutions and practices. Purpose, to mobilize international and domestic support for our national security objectives. Consequences, created propaganda ministries in the National Security Council, the State Department, and the White House that concentrated on, in the words of the NSC staff members in charge of the program, gluing black hats on the Sandinistas and white hats on UNO, the Contra's United Nicaraguan Opposition. Stories were planted in the press. Journalists were pressured. The GAO later found that these activities violated the law banning covert propaganda in the United States. How many other covert propaganda programs do you think are operating against the American citizens? I can assure you that there are many more than you would ever believe. NSDD 138, International Terrorism, April 3rd, 1984, classified. Subject, this directive endorsed the principle of preemptive strikes and retaliatory raids against terrorists and called on 26 federal agencies to recommend specific measures to combat terrorism. Purpose, to lessen international terrorism and free U.S. hostages in Lebanon. While this NSD directive pretends to be concerned about international terrorism, it is really a thinly disguised authorization of preemptive strikes and retaliatory raids against patriots in this country. When FEMA is activated, Patriots will be rounded up in the dead of the night, most likely on a national holiday such as Thanksgiving. Government agents and law enforcement offices in every city across the nation have received anti-terrorist training under this NSDD directive, and I can assure you the target is Patriots. Consequences. Set up the Terrorist Incident Working Group under North in the NSC, Its first major action was the interception and capture of the Achille Loro hijackers, 
which gave North's career an important boost. Either NSDD 138 or a subsequent NSD directive on terrorism authorized the training of three Lebanese units for preemptive strikes. When problems arose, Director of CIA William Casey took that operation off the books and enlisted Saudi Arabian help in an attempt to assassinate the head of Hezbollah. A resulting car bombing killed about 80 in Beirut. Sheikh Feldala, the target, was unhurt. The U.S. military, along with civilian law enforcement teams, then conducted joint anti-terrorist training across America to allay public fears the participants wore civilian clothing. NSD directives have become the de facto legislative vehicle of the national security state. It has become known throughout the research of Susan Fitzgerald, a research consultant at the Fund for Constitutional Government in Washington, who has collected declassified NSD directives that many were released without the White House letterhead at the top of the page and without the president's signatures at the bottom. This, she speculates, is to conceal the fact that the signatures on some of them would reveal that they have been made by Autopen, not by Ronald Reagan's own hand. That should give you a taste of what we are up against. Please understand that virtually all but a very few NSD directives still remain classified. And unless the public forces disclosure, their effect will probably never be known. Somewhere within the volumes of secret NSD directives, there is a plan to suspend the Constitution of the United States of America. The existence of this plan surfaced during the Iran-Contra hearings. Congressman Jack Brooks of Texas attempted to bring it into the open when he asked Colonel North directly if North had ever helped draft a plan to suspend the Constitution. Brooks was silenced by the committee chairman, Senator Daniel Inouye of Hawaii. Senator Inouye stated that the subject dealt with national security and any questions regarding the matter could be brought up during a closed door session. We never learned the outcome. I would like to know who gave anyone in any branch of government with any title the right to suspend the Constitution at any time for any reason under any conditions. I believe the plan to suspend the Constitution is directly tied to the underground facility called Mount Weather and to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. Mount Weather is so shrouded in secrecy that 99.9% .9 of Americans have never heard of it. FEMA, however, is another story. Remember Hurricane Hugo? Remember the federal agency that was sent to handle the emergency and was thrown out by the citizens because of gross incompetence? FEMA was incompetent because emergency management is just a guise for its real purpose, which is to take over local, state, and federal government in case of a national emergency. The only way FEMA could do such a thing is if the Constitution were suspended and martial law were to be declared. Therefore, its very existence is proof positive that a plan to suspend the Constitution does, in fact, exist. Mount Weather. Just outside of a sleepy little town called Bluemont, Virginia, about 46 miles west of Washington, D.C., is an area of wilderness covering what has been called the toughest granite rock in the eastern United States. The area is surrounded by signs marked restricted area, and this installation has been declared a restricted area. Unauthorized entry is prohibited. Other signs state, all persons and vehicles entering hereon are liable to search. Photographing, making notes, drawings, maps, or graphic representations of this area or its activities is prohibited. Such material found in the possession of unauthorized persons will be confiscated. Internal Security Act of 1915. The installation is beneath a mountain and its name is the Western Virginia Office of Controlled Conflict Operations. Its nickname is Mount Weather. It was ordered to be built by the Federal Civil Defense Administration, which is now the Federal Preparedness Agency. Mount Weather was designed in the early 50s as part of a civil defense program to house and protect the executive branch of the federal government. The official name was the Continuity of Government Program. Congress has repeatedly tried to discover the real purpose of Mount Weather, but so far has been unable to find out anything about the secret installation. Retired Air Force General Leslie Bray 
director of the Federal Preparedness Agency, told the Senate Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights in September 1975, I am not at liberty to describe precisely what is the role and the mission and capability that we have at Mount Weather or at any other precise location. In June 1975, Senator John Tunney of California, chairman of the Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights, charged that Mount Weather held dossiers on at least 100,000 Americans. He later alleged that the Mount Weather computers described as the best in the world can obtain millions of pieces of additional information on the personal lives of American citizens simply by tapping the data stored at any of the other 96 federal relocation centers. I know from my stint with the Office of Naval Intelligence that these dossiers consist of information collected about American patriots, men and women, who are most likely to resist the destruction of our Constitution and the formation of the totalitarian police state under the New World Order. The Patriot Data Bank is constantly updated so that when the appointed hour arrives, all patriots can be rounded up with little, if any, effort. The plan calls for this to be accomplished in the dead of night on a national holiday. The most likely holiday is Thanksgiving when everyone, no matter the religion, race, or creed, will be at home. The targets will be ripe for the picking after a heavy meal, maybe some alcoholic beverages, and during a deep sleep. There is a traitor in the patriot movement who provides the secret government with accurate names and addresses of patriots who will fight to protect and defend the Constitution. My recommendation is that no patriot should ever be at home or at the home of any family member on any holiday ever again until the traitors have been hung and the Constitution restored as the supreme law of the land. Some sources state that Mount Weather is virtually an underground city complete with dormitories, private apartments, streets, sidewalks, cafeterias, hospitals, water purification systems, power plant, office buildings, a lake fed by fresh water from underground springs, a mass transit system, and many other astounding things. Several disturbing facts emerge when one researches Mount Weather. One is the conclusion that a complete parallel government exists at the site. Nine federal departments exist there, agriculture, commerce, HEW, HUD, interior, labor, state, transportation, and the treasury. Apparently, at least five federal agencies are also in residence, FCC, Selective Service, Federal Power Commission, Civil Service Commission, and the Veterans Administration. Two privately owned corporations have offices at Mount Weather, the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Post Office. There is also an office of the presidency. What makes all this upsetting is that there is a president and a complete set of cabinet offices in residence at Mount Weather. Who are they and who appointed them? Where is such a thing provided for in the Constitution of the United States of America? Mount Weather is the operational center, the hub, of over 96 other underground federal relocation centers scattered across the United States. The majority of these appear to be concentrated in Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina. Each of these facilities contains computer data banks holding information not on enemy agents, Soviet diplomats, or suspected terrorists, but on American citizens, patriots. A list of other files kept at the facilities was furnished to the Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights in 1975. The list included military installations, government facilities, communications, transportation, energy and power, agriculture, manufacturing, wholesale and retail services, manpower, financial, medical and educational institutions, sanitary facilities, population, housing, shelter, and stockpiles. The committee concluded that these databases operate with few, if any, safeguards or guidelines. Senator James Borzak of South Dakota, a member of the subcommittee said, I feel the entire operation has eluded the supervision of either Congress or the courts. Chairman Tunney said, Mount Weather is out of control. Nothing was done by Congress to rectify the situation, however, and Mount Weather remains out of control. Former high-level officials from Mount Weather agree 
that the base at Mount Weather is much more than any standby government facility or storage center for the preservation of records. They describe it as an actual government in waiting. We do not merely store essential information. The facility attempts to duplicate the vital functions of the executive branch of the administration. As stated above, according to my research, this includes a president and all cabinet members actually in residence. Protocol even demands that subordinates address them as Mr. President or Mr. Secretary. Most of these mysterious appointees have held their positions through several administrations. We just act on the orders of the president and national emergencies, said one former Mount Weather official. The FPA in its 1974 annual report stated that studies conducted at Mount Weather involved the control and management of domestic political unrest where there are material shortages, such as food riots, or in strike situations where the FPA determines that there are industrial disruptions and other domestic resource crises. The report states that the bureaucracy at Mount Weather invokes what is called civil crisis management. Officials who were at Mount Weather and who have furnished us with data say that during the 1960s, the complex was actually prepared to assume certain governmental powers at the time of the 1961 Cuban Missile Crisis and the assassination of JFK in 1963. The source said that the installation used the tools of its civil crisis management program on a standby basis during the 67 and 68 urban riots and during a number of national anti-war demonstrations against the administration by the American people. Daniel J. Cronin, who was the assistant director for the FPA, outlined a massive surveillance and manipulation program that is directed against the American population on a continuing basis. The FPA has organized an impressive armament of resources and equipment. Mr. Cronin described in an interview his agency's attitude towards its wide-ranging surveillance program. We try to monitor situations, he said, and get to them before they become emergencies. No expenses spared in the monitoring program. He cited reconnaissance satellites, local and state police intelligence reports, and law enforcement agencies of the federal government as examples of the resources available to the FPA for the information gathering. The only document that I was able to find that attempts to outline some of the statutory authority of Mount Weather is Executive Order 11490. It was drafted by General George A. Lincoln, former director for the Office of Emergency Preparedness, preceded the FPA, and was signed into law by President Nixon in October 1969. Executive Order 11490 superseded Executive Order 11051, signed on October 2nd, 1962, by President Kennedy. Kennedy's order used the language, whereas national preparedness must be achieved as may be required to deal with increases in international tension with limited war or with general war, including attack upon the United States. Nixon's order began, whereas our national security is dependent upon our ability to assure continuity of government at every level in any national emergency type situation that might conceivably confront the nation, Nixon has deleted any reference to war, imminent attack and general war from the order and replaced them with the phrase during any emergency that might conceivably occur. Nixon's order, which is the one in effect today, allows the government in the form of FEMA to suspend the constitution for literally any reason they decide to call a national emergency. I cannot find a plan or executive order anywhere which outlines any procedure or allowance for the restoration of the constitution after a national emergency has ended. This leads to the obvious conclusion that no restoration of the Constitution is contemplated or desired by those in power. In 1975, Senator Tunney expressed concern. We know from what we've heard in the press that 15,000 names were being maintained by the FBI for detention in an emergency. We also know that the IRS had its files on individual taxpayers. We know that the CIA had their Operation Chaos, 
and that NSA has the records of conversations that have been intercepted electronically. My question is this, is there anyone like yourself, General Bray, that is in control of the overall access to this data if it is maintained in a relocation site? And your answer, as I understood it, is no, Tunney continued. General Bray, I must say that I still don't know who's in control of these relocation centers. You say you don't have that knowledge, and still we don't know from the three witnesses that we had here today that they had information as to who has control of these centers. I am not at liberty, Bray answered, to describe precisely what is the role and the mission and the capability that we have at Mount Weather or at any other precise location. I firmly believe that our continuity of government program has not provided continuity at all, but has been the instrument for discontinuing open and democratic government and that the very program designed to protect Americans has actually been turned against us. We at the executive level here were active in either OSS, the State Department, or the European Economic Administration. During those times, and without exception, we operated under directions issued by the White House. We are continuing to be guided by such directives, the substance of which were to the effect that we should make every effort to so alter a life in the United States as to make possible a comfortable merger with the Soviet Union. H. Rowan Gaither, president of the Ford Foundation, 1953. And these are the sources. And that will be the end of this section of Bill Cooper's Behold a Pale Horse. Please leave your comments, your thoughts. Have a great night. Peace. Shoot.